I think about, because it helps me think about evaluating the impact of microcredit is, uh, you know, if I told you that uh, a couple of randomized studies had been done of the impacts of mortgages on homeowners in the United States, looking at whether their, you know, incomes were higher, consumption was higher, et cetera, et cetera. And it was done, say, from 2005 to 2007, and either it found positive impacts or no impact at all. Would you conclude from that that you knew everything you needed to know about the role of the mortgage industry in U.S. economic development? Obviously not. Uh, and it's a reminder for me that, at least in the case of a, a financial service, you need to think about the dynamics of the system as well if you want to really think fully about the role in development. And that doesn't vitiate anything I said before or anybody else has said about the value of rigorous trials of particular interventions. Um, but it does get me thinking about, you know, what when, one aspect, one kind of limitation for these the studies. Um, and, you know, it kind of reminds me, you know, Dean has been one of the people who has been out there saying, uh, uh, probably being selectively quoted by the reporters as saying microfinance, microcredit is not a silver bullet, um, which we all know now. Uh, so the rhetoric that we often heard around microcredit, uh, that uh, microcredit is helping to solve global poverty is kind of overblown. But actually, helping to solve global poverty is in the subtitle of this book. And so I'm wondering, you know, is there a certain bit of marketing going on here, perhaps informed by some very, some very smart, smart behavioral economists as well? Uh, so as I say, if you would like to speak or go to questions, uh, we would, there'll be uh, microphones around, I think. Yes, there's one in the back. If you do ask a question, please identify yourself. I think at this point, do you just want to run it, Dean? Um, sure. Okay. And, um... So thank you, thank you, David, and um, thank you, um, Carola, Frank, and Ruth. Um, so I, I wanted to share a couple quick thoughts. I didn't want to. Um, I, I really appreciated all the comments everyone was making. They were very um, um, somewhat inspiring. Some points very inspiring for for future future books or future thoughts and future things to to be thinking hard about. I, I, two things that kind of stood out. I just wanted to to, to mention. One is a, I think a really key point. Um, to just follow up with what David just said, um, which is one of the themes at, at IPA in particular is, and it, it's one of the, I think, the problems that exists in academia. And it's one of the reasons why I, I, I wanted to, I started IPA when, when I first got out of graduate school, which is, as academics, we don't really have good incentives to do similar research, to do replication, to test this, to take something that has been tested in one setting and now try it somewhere else. Now, it's a little bit more complicated than that. It's not to say that we just need to kind of have larger sample sizes, but, but the point is that if we have a clear, if we want to really escape the problem of the criticism that says, oh, well, this is an evaluation done in one place, one point in time with one set of people, will it hold elsewhere? And the mortgage example is just a perfect poignant way of making that point. Well, there's two ways to respond to that. One is to say, you're right, that was a waste of time, let's not do an evaluation. And the other is to say, no, you're right. That's absolutely true. And what that means is we need to have two things. A theory as to why this works, and that theory should tell us something about the context and the factors that need to, take, that need to be in place in order for this to be true. And two, we should be testing that theory in more than one place in one point. We don't just do it in one spot and then just have that one data point match our theory. right? We need multiple data points. And now each data point is an evaluation. But that's a problem in academia, and we don't, you know, unfortunately, have quite the right incentives in place. We have, I think, we have the incentives if there's ten studies, to then kind of write the nice big meta paper that goes across. But we don't really have incentives to work on paper number four really hard. And this is one reason why IPA was started was this idea that we do need to take those types of questions that are singular questions, singular types of interventions, and see it done in multiple places and carry that torch forward. And, and, and build that type of um, that type of portfolio of projects, and that's one thing that we we do focus on very heavily. Um, those are hard to do, though. We have found, in fact, most of the times that we've ended up doing them, in the case of microcredit, it is the it is the fact that we didn't have a concerted effort from the beginning with one donor. But in the other situations where we've had to do that, it has required a single donor to come forward and say, "I want to nail that question," and now I'm going to fund seven of these. So we have a program, for instance, with Ford Foundation, and it's joint with CGAP to um, evaluate a, a safety, so, safety, social safety net program that reaches to the very, very poorest, provides them grants and trainings and consumption support and savings, 
and, and tries to lift up the individuals who don't have any real income generating activity with a, some sort of livelihood. Um, and these are underway right now. The early ones that are coming out showing to be quite successful, um, but it's still early. So we, you know, we're not, we haven't like written the, 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 the main kind of punchlines yet. So that's, that's one, one thought. Um, not to, there were many things that were said that, and I don't mean to only pick on one uh, to respond to, but there's one that you said that I really, that meant a lot to me, and I wanted to, wanted to kind of say my thoughts on this, and this is the choice in the word proven. And, and I happen to totally, I, I completely, um, I mean, I, I think Ruth and I have talked about it before when I think when we started this, and, I, and it's not, it was not an easy choice. And here's, you know, here's the reality. So first of all, we thought hard about the promising impact initiative. It just doesn't, you know, we, we found ourselves back with the, the camera problem. And the reality is when we think about what we want in the world of fundraising, right, we want, what we want ideally, I don't mind when, you know, I don't mind that care story. I don't mind the fact that it happens as long as the money was going to good use. So I don't, yeah, I actually don't think it's a bad thing if someone gives mindlessly, just as long as it was effective. So we need to either one of two things. You either got to work with the organizations to make sure that, they, you know, let their marketing team do the most effective things they can as long as you know that the organizations are doing the right thing. Or you got to work on the donor side to get them to focus on the right one. And the reality is, you know, we're trying both tacks, right? Now, but, you know, at the same time, what we're trying to do is recognize that, okay, we are a research organization, first and foremost. We're, you know, but we, it's not a very, it, it's a very, it's a very depressing message if the message we want to send to the world is that we just don't know anything. Like, there's nothing you can act on, right? And so, and so that's, you know, that's where we're trying to push hard is to say, look, there are some things that we think we can act on. It doesn't mean there's, there's, uh, you know, I'm, I'm instinctively always doubtful, um, but there, but I also firmly believe that there are some things that we simply have to do because it's the best shot we got. Um, and, and so I think what Ruth is picking up on is the marketing combo with the feeling of we got to do something even if we don't know. And now, now let's put on our kind of hats on how best to describe this. Um, so um, it reminds me of a, um, a, 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 I'll show, I'll tell this hopefully very briefly, but it's a short parable by, what's that? Go to questions? Okay. <laughs> it's a Peter Singer Lake analogy, which I really like, and you can see it in chapter one of the book where we talk about the lifesaver, and it tells the exact answer to this question, which is we got to still try even if we don't know. Okay, let's go to questions. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah sorry. <laughs> Uh, yes, hello. My name is Marcel Riku. I'm a student at Johns Hopkins Science, just down the street. Um, and my question is, uh, it, it randomization and random control trials uh, are a great idea at the kind of at the micro level. But I've a professor at SICE who works on governance and makes a very interesting point that you can't randomly control, you can't uh, randomly separate ministries or one government. So uh, how do you respond to that? What would your uh, ideas be for rigorous analysis of Governance projects, for example.
Um, why don't I, I, I have such a bad memory on I hate taking seven questions and then so I'll, I'll do the first and third and let you guys take the second. So the first on governance, uh, there's certainly things in the governance space that are out of the question, but there's a lot that's in. In fact, we, um, you know, there's a there's a, a, a pot of money at IPA that and JPAL that is being used to um, accept proposals from people to do to do randomized evaluations of questions and I can just throw out a couple examples of types of things that you can do so I think the single most cited and discussed one by Ben Olkin in Indonesia where they randomize two things um, the monitoring of the of the of the the quality of local roads the local roads were being built at the local level by the and had kind of the, the governance control was at the local level so the quality then the corruption was about the, the local individual saying they spent more than they really did on materials and saying they hired people when they didn't. And they went in and they did an audit um, and randomized the right, well, probability of the audit and told people up front, you either will be audited with 100% probability or you will be audited with 4% probability. Made a huge difference in the quality of the roads and it was worth the extra cost of the audits in terms of the improved quality of the roads. They also He also tried a second intervention at the same time. It was a two by two design. That, that allowed the community to have a meeting and, and, and impose complaints. Right? This is a very common approach to governance, is the idea of local empowerment, give them the information, give them the ability to voice their, the information that they have about local corruption um, so that the, the middle level official can be punished. It turned out that wasn't that effective at, at, at all in that context. That doesn't mean we're, you know, we're done and let's all only do audits and let's never do the other, but it's a striking point, I think, of where this can be done and how you can tackle those types of situations. Um, there's other ones we're involved in in, in Uganda that are that are about giving um, cr creating just this the same thing about how to collect information in local communities about whether their officials are actually doing something or not. Um, in Mexico, we did one where we randomized distributing information to um, to communities with flyers about the um, various fiscal issues and the way the money was being spent at the local level and it had a big impact on actual votes in the next election. So there's definitely things that can be done and evaluated and, and learned. Um, it, it's not everything, just, just like we've said. Um, so I'm going to jump to the third. Just to go ahead. So the third, uh, very shortly, I, I actually have had this kind of pet peeve myself. <laughs> so um, I've done both style and I think of them as very different and I think there's... Um, there is a lot of vagueness because they both often get thrown into the term field experiment, and I think that has kind of done the world disservice by calling both field experiments. I think there's a place for both, and I actually agree it would be nice if we saw a, a, a cleaner description of them. I've read many a paper or proposal where I'm still halfway through and I'm not sure which it is, and I get very frustrated. Um, I've, I've proposed for quite some time, but not pushed it very hard, is to create a taxonomy that where people, so that they do end up going under one rubric, but that you picture, I don't know if you're familiar with the geek code, but if you Google it, you can see it. It's a little code you can write down that tells you exactly like how, how much you know about Star Trek and Star Wars and Dungeons and Dragons and computer code and what languages you speak. And it's a little code that you put on the bottom of your email. And again, of course, you know, it's a geek code. But you could imagine the same thing on papers that you just, you know, in one string of letters and numbers, you manage to codify exactly what you've done methodologically. It would actually be really useful. Um, for separating this out. It's not so easy. We've tried writing out the code and it's hard. It's not to say it's impossible, but I, I do think it'd be a, 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 a useful exercise. <laughs> now we know how you explain Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let, uh, let me start on the excellent question that was uh, raised about how to be transparent about um, failures in an age when the budget hawks are out and there's lots of competition for resources. Um, so first of all, it's extremely hard. I, I think uh, that among all the um, core standards in evaluation policies, those pertaining to transparency will be the very, very hardest uh, to uphold um, and will take tremendous political spine. Um, I do think that there is safety in numbers, and if the U.S. government, for example, or all bilateral agencies were willing and able to uh, accept and adhere to a high standard with respect to disclo public disclosure of evaluation findings, then th those who suppress findings would not be um, would not get the dividend of 
uh, hiding their results. Um, that's a little ways off, but I think that there, with pressure from outside groups, it could it could happen. Uh, I do think that it, it makes it more um, it makes it easier to do when outside groups immediately welcome and give the reputational uh, brownie points to organizations that do uh, re uh, release and reveal in candid ways negative findings. A couple of other points. Uh, we could, outside groups, could help to change the discussion to some extent around every single dollar of development assistance being having to be fully effective to what the pharmaceutical companies have done absolutely brilliantly. So they say, 90% of what we do fails. That's why we have to charge so much. So, <laughs> so somewhere between that narrative and the current uh, narrative in development assistance, there's, there's space for being honest about how you have to spend a little to learn a little or spend a little to learn a lot. And final point before turning it over to Frank uh, is um, I think that there is space to have project designs that are what you might call tri-phase uh, projects uh, with tri having two meanings of three and tri. Um, so the first phase being a uh, real proof of concept, the second phase being uh, um, scaling up um, uh, to a modest degree, perhaps a, a, a comparison of two different approaches, kind of variation in treatment design uh, compared to a control, and then a guarantee of funding for uh, whichever of those approaches is the most promising so that the implementers are incentivized not only to do the evaluations, but to take on board the findings from an evaluation. And I think that there is space to do that, and it's not easy, but I, I do think that it's possible. And in fact, we've tried that. Uh, Dean had asked me to give an example. Uh, at MCC in Burkina Faso, uh, one of the proposals came forward to us was a very large land reform project. And land reform, kind of land tenure security kinds of things, is, is an area where I think it's remarkable the broad agreement that it's a good idea and that it's a it's an important aspect of the kind of uh, you know economic modernization process, if you will. I mean, the things that you need to do to get investment and growth. Um, what's surprising is how little evidence there is that it actually works that way. Um, there's some evidence that it works in some cases. There's some evidence in some places where it doesn't, and it can actually have perverse results. Uh, you can come up with all kinds of situations where somebody can actually be worse off as a result of, through unintended consequences. Um, and in this particular case, we were unable, so MCC's model is to do a benefit cost analysis before we fund to, to see not just whether there will be an impact, but whether it's large enough to justify the investment. And in that case, we could not do it. Uh, and so we were faced with a couple of possibilities. One was to simply not go forward with the project, and that had its own consequences because we were so far down the road and, and there had been certain kinds of uh, understandings reached in terms of the size of the program and what direction it would go. Uh, the second would be simply to fund the full program and, uh, and that was one that some people thought was the best idea. Um, but what we came up with it was was something that was similar to what Ruth described, which was to see it as a as an initial phase rollout, where where it would be done in some communities, and that after three years, half, roughly halfway through, we would look to see whether we were seeing the kinds of consequences. Now it's far too early to see the kind of economic impact we expect, you know, 20 years later, but that everybody agreed there ought to be certain things that we would see that would show the program was already on track and implementation, and in fact that certain perceptions had changed. And so it, with a randomized design, uh, the implementations proceeded with the understanding that implementation decisions 
as to whether we scale up or whether we stop, well, whether we continue to five years with the original pilot. I think everybody's agreed we would not stop the program after three years, but whether we would continue for a five-year pilot instead, uh, that that would be based on the evaluation results, uh, the interim evaluation results. Um, so, so that can be done. It's very hard to do, and it's very hard to do that when it requires a humility that, like I said, is common amongst uh, kind of research and academic institutions, but but which is simply not common in donor institutions or or, or aid agencies writ large, which I, I have to say I, I really find unfortunate. Um, getting a program funded de depends on expressing certainty, and it's, that's obviously contrary to the, the uncertainty that you would have to have a program like that. Um, going to the issue of, of this kind of what happens in failure, a couple of things you can do. One is to make sure you've changed before you admit you've failed. Um, and as silly as that sounds, that we should see as, as success, right? I mean, uh, and, and even there, it's not sure that that will protect you. Right, because there will be people who will not be satisfied with that answer. But that is one answer, and it, and it's and and like I said, it, I'd be happy if we had that. I mean, you know, at some level, because really what we're trying to do is learn, and 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 so that would be an expression of that. Um, I think Ruth pointed out too. You know, make sure that the people who support you and understand you support you, and you know, even when you're admitting failure. And so that requires having a. A serious support network. One of the things I have found is that um, often those people who should support you do not. Uh, I'll mention Bill Easterly. Uh, I don't know him well, but I know him well enough that I can probably take this pot shot at him. Uh, he, he's been very useful, I think, in shaping and framing the discussion, but he, he's not very helpful in telling us what works or providing praise when things are being done right. Um, and I think that includes MCC. Uh, in the sense of saying, you know, being willing to, to, to base your programs on evidence, being willing to measure them and then say when it's failed. And I keep waiting for him to say, you know, even if he doesn't support MCC, you know, he might say no MCC, uh, but I would like him to say that what MCC is doing is in the right direction what he would like to see other aid agencies do. Because in fact, when he says what aid agencies should do, he's describing MCC, and yet he refuses to do that. Uh, I would say some of the conservative think tanks also you know, at some level are against foreign assistance, period. Even if they are, at some level they ought to say some foreign assistance is done better than others and this is the way we would like to see it. They cannot bring themselves to do that. And I wish, and, and we actually have conversations with some people like that who said, you know, and so, and, and then on the, on the other side of the spectrum, those who are in charge of foreign, you know, supporting foreign assistance all the time, they should be willing to admit that it doesn't always work and support the model. I just, like to add something to that briefly. I think we have to be very cognizant that there is intrinsic trade-off between accountability and learning. And while we're performing a, uh, an impact evaluation, uh, uh, an evaluation that's more towards learning, it will be used for accountability purposes. And a bad evaluation, I mean, let's say a non-rigorous evaluation will also be used for accountability and learning and in this whole political economy discussion. And there's a tension that is not reconcilable. I'm, I'm sorry, but you know, in that program that, that, that Ruth was my reviewer, then we went to implement it, right? And we found out uh, that we had actually made some huge mistakes in implementation, right? Uh, of course not design. No, no. It was the implementation that failed. Now, so, so people confuse eligibility with project beneficiaries. So they decided that instead of the project beneficiaries were gonna be pregnant women. So they decided eligibility was gonna be pregnant women. Guess what? That we had more pregnant women in those municipalities going up in a month really fast, right? Uh, and we found this out, and I'm willing to admit it, but, <laughs> and actually we wrote a paper on it, but nobody saw it, but <laughs> that's a good thing. Uh, but, um, but, but, but that was a huge failure. Right, and, uh, and how do we find out about it? By having a randomized trial, because we could actually net the effect and actually several rounds. We did it in the middle of the program, and I'm telling the story because we fixed it in the, on the way, and by the time we came up to the next round, thank God it was a temp effect, and it was gone. But, so women were shortening their, spa their, their spacing uh, to get into the program. Married women, so I'll, I'll 
not bad, but, but still, right? And so, uh, but this is a learning. This is a learning activity. This, you know, it's really funny when I tell the story, but it was really tragic. I mean, because we were having the, the inverse effect that we were looking for, and this we found through, uh, through, through seeking knowledge, right? Um, it does not bid well that result for accountability, right? You fall into this whole political realm of ideology and positions that exist in, in foreign aid. And so, you know, you, you, as when we lead the discussion externally of what we're doing and how we're doing it, you know, the messages, and that's what the marketing, to me, is really important, and that's why I wish you would have talked more about this in the book, is that you have different audiences. And so your information is just, just information for transparency's sake. It, it needs to be out there and it needs to be available, but you play up some information more than others to different audiences in the hope that, that, that we can have a, a more informed discussion in different fora. Thanks. Please join me in thanking Dean and Jake and Carola and Frank and Ruth.